Good evening, everybody, and welcome back to Amy's Ammo. It's wonderful to be with you tonight or at whichever time you happen to be uh, watching and joining us. Uh, we are excited about this month's theme. We've been talking about who is God. And the more I study this, the older I get, the more who God is even means to me, um, the more I realize I don't know as much as I think I know, <laughs> the more I realize I want to know more, um, and they, like you just you can't exhaust who God is. So really, in everything that we're talking about over these next couple weeks, we, we cannot exhaust who He is. He's He's too great. He's too grand. He's doing. We could talk about Him every day for the rest of our lives and still fail to cover all that He is and um, all of who He is. And so we're just literally scratching the surface, just getting to know Him a little bit better. And I want to encourage each of us that that be uh, an important mission, the most important mission in our life, is to get to know Him, take time to know Him every day. He's not just this great big figure uh, of our or figment of our imagination. He's not just this grand figure in the sky or this invisible being um, that we imagine up in our minds like like a movie and, and he just comes and you know does his magic here on earth. He's he's not a man that he should lie. He is God. So he's not like you know people in our lives they can hurt us, they can harm us, they can betray us, they can lie to us. They can pretend they're one thing and then be another thing. They can be hypocritical. Um, they can be all kinds of things, both good and bad. People can change. People can fluctuate. But the Word says that our God remains the same. He's the same yesterday, today, and forever. Revelations tells us He's the Alpha and the Omega. He's the beginning and the end. He's the one who was, who is, and who will always be. Um, and we can't say that for people in our life. The people in our life, including ourselves, there's a time where we begin, there's a time where we enjoy and embrace life, hopefully, <laughs> and then there's a time where we end. And every single person in our life, every single person, past, present, and future, has a beginning and the end. But God himself is the beginning, and he is the end. And so there, there isn't, and, and the Bible also says he doesn't change. He's the same yesterday, today, and forever. Uh, there's, just as you, as you search through the scriptures, um, I'm looking up the different terms for God. Uh, over the last couple of weeks, we talked about a few different uh, Hebrew and, and uh, Greek words uh, relating to God. Uh, today we're going to talk about um, some of his characteristics and in who he is, and um, I'd love to get into even more over the, you know, some other weeks to come, uh, those things like Jehovah Jireh, Jehovah Rapha, Jehovah Nisi, those kinds of things. But I'd encourage you to do your own study and your own research on the names of God and um, who God is as well. But as you study the scriptures, I mean, there's so much richness in who he is. Just simply, God is good. Just ponder that. Just spend one whole day, one whole week, even just one whole hour pondering all the ways that God is good. And and even if you've had bad things happen, negative things happen in your life, uh, the more you meditate upon that truth of God being good and you maybe ask him to reveal himself to you if you feel like all you've seen is bad. Or maybe you're in a place where... Uh, and, and something has wounded you or broken you so, so badly or so deeply that it's just hard for you to see God's goodness. It's hard for you to find it. Um, the word says that we'll see the, the goodness of the Lord in the land of the living, right? Um, I, I'll live to see the goodness of the Lord in the land of the living. And so that's my prayer for you is if you haven't seen him as a good God, if you haven't known him as a good God, I promise you he's good. And I believe that he'll reveal that goodness if you're willing to, to seek him, if you're willing to receive his goodness and, and willing to ask him to open the eyes of your understanding, open the, the windows of your heart so you can let him in, open your ears so that you can hear uh, the good things that he wants to speak to you and, and the things he wants to reveal to you. 
And uh, today, as I said, I'm going to just cover a few things about characteristics of God. And one of them is that he's faithful. We've already talked about his goodness a bit, um, that he's faithful. 1 Corinthians 10.13 says, No temptation has overtaken you except that which is common to mankind. And God is faithful. He will not let you be tempted beyond what you can bear. But when you are tempted, he will also provide a way out so that you can endure it. So in, in that sense, he's faithful where we get tempted, where we feel like we could fail or where we are about to fail. Or, you know, sometimes temptations come in very subtle, sneaky ways and, and, and they're a bit tricky. Uh, temptation can be manipulative. And there's a way that the Bible even says our own heart can deceive us. Our, our own heart can, can um, drive us towards things while we yet pretend in our own heart or our own mind that we weren't seeking after those things. But, but there's a way that in the wickedness of our flesh, we can, we can start leading ourselves down a path. And of course, the, the enemy comes in and he, uh, tries to manipulate and, and, uh, confuse or he tries to, to sneak in those subtle little temptations that, that we'll fall for and, and just open the door a little bit and, then a little bit more, and then a little bit more. We entertain those thoughts. Should I? Shouldn't I? Maybe just a little bit. Maybe just today. I, I'll stop tomorrow. Um, when we come up with excuses and justifications for why it's okay for right now, but I'll quit later. You know, whatever it is, there's, there's ways that temptation um, plays around with us. But here the word says that God is faithful to us. He's faithful to give us a way out. So when our heart is really to be faithful to Him, when our heart is truly to, to grab hold of that God characteristic of faithfulness and say, Lord, I want to be faithful. I don't want to walk in sin. I don't want to be lured by temptations that aren't healthy or good for me. I don't want to be tricked by things that are temporary. I don't want to, I don't want my mind, my will, and my emotions to be played games with. I, I, I don't want to entertain the enemy in any part of my life. I, I want to see the goodness of God. I want to experience the goodness of God, and I want to walk in His faithfulness. When when our heart is willing, and and we're ready, and 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 we're um, wanting to let go of those fleshly ways, those fleshly desires, He provides a way out. It's just us to ask for it. it it's us to to seek it and to pursue it and to pursue Him. You know, and in our essence, He's the way out. <laughs> And the faithful one is the one who's faithful to, to, to you to, to help guide you in your way out. The words, he's also a guide. Uh, he's a guide to us. He, he lights the pathway that we're to walk on. He'll reveal the direction that we're to go. He's wisdom. Uh, Proverbs talks a lot about him being wisdom. He, and and uh, James talks about how he'll pour out wisdom in abundance if we'll ask for it. We ask for wisdom of him and he'll pour it out. We know with uh, Solomon, Solomon was asked what did he want, and he could have been, he could have asked God for anything he wanted. He could have been given anything, but he asked God for wisdom. And in response to his asking for wisdom, God gave him wealth, and he gave him influence, and he gave him uh, power and, and authority as a king. And um, on top of that, he still had all that wisdom. You know, so uh, God is wisdom and he'll provide wisdom and he's faithful to do that for us if we're tempted in different areas. And even, we can be tempted even just to hate people. We can be tempted, it's not always just a, a behavior like, you know, going to the bar and drinking and, uh, you know, dealing with addictions or things like that. It's not even necessarily something like stealing. It's not always something sexual. Sometimes it's just doubting. I'm tempted to doubt you, Lord, and, and I want to walk in faith. You know, it's our faith that pleases Him, and and it's His faithfulness that that draws us closer to Him. And so He's faithful. If you're struggling with a temptation today, He's there, He's willing, He's ready, and He's able to help you see that way out. Just open your eyes, open your mind, and 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 open your hands to say, Lord, take me by the hand and lead me out. I want to get out of this situation, and he will. He'll guide you out. Second Timothy 2.13 says, If we are unfaithful, he remains faithful, for he cannot deny who he is. 
uh, I love the scripture. I, I, I love scripture, period. But this scripture to me is really powerful because we know in our humanness, people in our lives have been unfaithful to us and we've been unfaithful to people in our lives in different ways, whether it's to our job, to our spouse, to our best friend, uh, to people who've had confidence and faith in us and we've disappointed us, even if we've not tried to be unfaithful, but someone has perceived us unfaithful. Or, or we may have done the same, you know, thought someone should be something and they were not that thing, you know. The, the word says that even if we're unfaithful, he is not unfaithful. Why is he not unfaithful? Because he can't be. Faithfulness is who he is. God can't go against who he is. If he's faithful, he's faithful. He can't do anything unfaithful because it's not in him to do it. And I think that's encouraging to us also as believers because when, when we're in Christ, and, and we're walking uh, in the fruits of our salvation and living out our salvation, we know that we've become uh, new. We've been made new. So if I'm no longer a sinner and I've become a saint, that means it's no longer in me to entertain these temptations that I t just talked about a few minutes ago. It's no longer in me to desire to be sinful. And, 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 and where maybe I battle that, of course, it's in me that I remember he's faithful and that doesn't change and he can help me be faithful. He can help me shift and change my thinking. He can help me to renew my mind. He can help me to change my behaviors. Why? Because he's faithful. And why do I want to become faithful? Because I want to be more like him. I want to be faithful. I want to walk in the fruits of faithfulness. You know, there aren't good fruits in unfaithfulness. <laughs> Um, and I want to walk in those fruits, but I think that's powerful. He can't deny who he is. And, and the more you think about that, the more I think about that. Who are you? Who am I? Uh, you know, wh when I'm walking with the Lord and I'm in relationship with him, who am I? Who am I to him? What are the characteristics and the fruits that I'm meant to bear? So if I'm unloving right now and I'm doing unloving things, as a believer, I've been made loving. The Spirit of God is renewed in me, which means I'm filled with love. My spirit is filled with love. It's my mind that needs to be renewed so that my mind can receive and, and let that love flow through me so that then out of my, my body, out of my flesh, you know, my flesh and blood, I can reveal the love of God through me. And, and it's, it's that place of beginning to recognize who He is and then who I am in Him. And so we can be faithful as God is faithful if, if we'll continue to pursue that. Amen. Lamentations 2, 20, uh, excuse me, 3, 22 and 23 says, The faithful love of the Lord never ends. His faithful love never ends. His mercies never cease. Great is his faithfulness. His mercies begin afresh each morning. So here we see that not only is God faithful, but he's also merciful. Not only is he merciful, but his mercies are new every morning. They don't end. They never cease. So I can, be unfaith I can be faithful today, and I can be unfaithful tomorrow. I can be faithful right now, and five minutes later be unfaithful in my thoughts, in my actions, in my behaviors. But God himself is faithful all the time. His faithful love never ends. Here we also see that he's love. His love never ends. And his, his uh, mercies are new every single morning. When you wake up every single morning, God's mercies are new and fresh for you and for me. We know that God is also light. First John 1 John 1.5 says, This is the message we have heard from him and declare to you. God is light. In him there is no darkness at all. If you're experiencing darkness in your life, dark thoughts, uh, dark feelings, dark emotions. There have been times where I've been maybe going to sleep at night, maybe in the, if, if we've been out of town or something like that and I'm in a hotel room. There's been times where I've just felt this dark presence in the room and it's not a peaceful presence. It's not a comforting presence. It's, it's a, a creepy presence or it just feels dark and uncomfortable like, like something or someone is there and, and I, I realize, hey, that's not God. <laughs> that's not God watching over me. That, that's a, some sort of a evil spirit 
trying to cause me to fear, to not be able to sleep, to disrupt my peace and, and disrupt my rest. But the word says that the children of the Lord sleep peacefully, that we rest peacefully. And so I have that right to claim that. So I chase that spirit out and I remember God is light. And I thank you, Lord, that your light fills this room. I thank you, Lord, that the light of your life fills my mind, fills my life, um, fills my being, and that it not only fills me, but it comes out of me. So that when people see me, when people are around me, because the light of God lives in me, I then also become a light to people. And, and you also have that same uh, characteristic in you, that uh, as a believer, as someone who is born again, God is light, and that light and life that he is can shine and flow through you every day, all day long. In fact, that's what he desires, is that his light shine through us, right? We're not to hide that light. You know that song that we sang when we were little kids, that this little light of mine, I'm going to let it shine, and, and it says hide it under a bushel. No, you know, we're not going to put it under the basket and hide it. We want to, to shine uh, that light brightly. In fact, um, being the, the, the light of God in this world, I, I find it interesting that Christians often get tempted to, you know, we go to church, we get, you know, training, teaching, healing, we get ministered to, God touches our lives, He changes our lives in so many powerful ways, but then we get comfortable being in that place, we get comfortable being in that church building or that Bible study or that fellowship of believers that we've, we've, uh, grown to feel connected to and safe with, and we start getting uncomfortable being around people who don't know the Lord, around people who are not believers. How do we answer who don't know the Lord? How do I love the lost and, and help those who don't know Him to know Him like I've come to know Him? And that's kind of what this uh, hiding our light is all about. We're, we're not meant to get to know him and to to have him reveal himself to us for us to hide it or for us to just be in a place where we're all lights lighting up a room. We're, we're meant to go into dark places. We're meant to go into the places where darkness dwells and be a light to shine the, the light of God in that place so people see light, so people see who God is in and through you. You know, I, I once had a... a pastor's wife who, who told us how she had prayed uh, and, and um, tried to drive out all the non-believers out of her office, and she was bragging about how, um, as she prayed, the people who didn't believe in the Lord left. And um, I personally believe that's a form of witchcraft. I don't believe that's a prayer that God would want to answer. Um, she was praying her own will into the situation and seeking um, what she desired. Uh, God's will would be that those people would come to know him and that she would be a light to those people. But sometimes being a light is challenging. Sometimes we're in environments where people hate us. You know, you think about Jesus. When Jesus walked the earth, he did nothing wrong. He, he loved people. He cared about the unlovable. He loved the people who, who uh, culturally were not accepted, who, who were culturally rejected and ignored and denied. And he, he, he showed the love and the light of, of God through his actions and how he loved people. But yet he was despised by many. He had people follow him often when he performed signs and wonders, when, when people experienced the miracles of the loaves and the fishes and people being fed, or when someone rose from the dead, or when someone's sight came back. You know, suddenly had, he had followers, but when people had to pay a price to walk with him and talk with him and serve him, he didn't have the same level of followers as when he was um, performing signs and wonders. And, and over time, those religious spirits that were in that uh, culture at that time began to rise up against him and attack him. So even in his innocence, they began to treat him as if he was guilty. And that happens to us sometimes. Sometimes we get born again and all of a sudden our family is calling us Jesus freaks and they, <laughs> they think we're, we're crazy. Some of them think we've joined some kind of a cult. Uh, <laughs> uh, some feel as if we've betrayed them, maybe because there were other religious beliefs that uh, were, were traditions or, or our family was deeply rooted in a particular 
um, religious uh, belief and, and uh, lifestyle or culture, and then we get born again and we begin to think differently and something changes. You know, we become a light, but there's a way that those around us uh, will will react sometimes to that light. You know, have you ever uh, been like the house is all dark at night and and it's still dark outside in the early morning and you go to like flip on the light and and your eyes have to like adjust to the <laughs> to the brightness, you know, or like sometimes my kids when they want to sleep in, they don't want to get up yet. I'll come in and I'll flip on the light and say it's time to get up, and one of them will shout, "Shut the lights off!" because <laughs> it's too bright your eyes have been closed they've been in darkness and that's what happens when our eyes are open to the light of God that when our eyes become open there's an excitement and there's a joy that happens in us but then when we enter some place or somebody's life where darkness uh, resides where darkness has had a stronghold and, and has um, been uh, controlling people's minds and lives and, and oppressing them we come in and shine a light. There are some people who will be like, yes, I want that light. I've been looking for that light all my life. And there will be other people who are like, no, shut that off. It's too late for me. I can't take it. And and we bear with them. And, and we still love them. And we still give them that time to let their eyes adjust, to let them uh, desire to, to receive that light. It says in First Thessalonians 5, 5, for you are all children of light, children of the day. We are not of the night nor of the darkness. So we're children of the light, which we've talked about already. As we become uh, his children, we walk in light. There is no longer any darkness in us. And then John 3.20, For everyone who does wicked things hates the light and does not come to the light, lest his works should be exposed. I always found it interesting how when uh, kids do naughty things, when we're kids and we're doing naughty things, we hide in dark places. We go in the places where we can't be seen <laughs> or where we think we can't be seen, not realizing even if we hid from our parents or from the police or from whoever may uh, cause us to get our big brothers or sisters, you know, whoever we might get in trouble with, our teachers, um, whoever we're hiding from, you know, we don't realize God still sees. And even in our own mind and our own heart, we still know. But it says here that everyone who does wicked things hates the light. That's a pretty powerful statement. But if I'm embracing wicked things, that means I hate light and I'm embracing darkness. I'm choosing to embrace darkness. Um, and it says they don't come to the light. So people who want to stay in darkness don't come to the light. You know, people who want to stay bound won't come to the freedom that you offer them. You know, if you've been trying this, sometimes there are people that we may try to reach. There's people that you may reach out to and say, you know, God loves you. I love you. I care. There's, there's, uh, people, when I did, um, some teachings in a prison years ago, there were guys who'd come to the, to the teaching and there were those who really want to hear what you have to say and there were those who were just forced to be there and they could care less what you have to say. There are those who are very receptive and there are those who are not. So those who want to remain in darkness will remain in darkness. And it doesn't matter how nice you are. It doesn't matter how how um, sweet you are. It doesn't matter what you give them. They're still going to embrace their darkness until they decide they're done with it. Is uh, If you look at like um, Pharaoh's heart, you know, some, some people are like Pharaoh's. The more uh, God's light shines upon them, around them, or... or in their vicinity, the harder their heart gets. And that's what happened with Pharaoh in the story of the Israelites. His heart became harder and harder the more and more God revealed who he was to them. And that happens sometimes. And then there are those who melt like like uh, wax. You know, there are those who soften over time. And so you just got to use wisdom as you try to reach out for people. But it's my heart's desire that both you and I that, that all of us who are sharing this time together right now, that we desire the light of God, that we gravitate towards his light and towards his truth. And God is truth as well. Uh, Acts twenty six eighteen says to open their eyes so that they may turn from darkness. So we pray, Lord, turn our eyes from darkness to the light and from the power of Satan to God. 
that they may receive forgiveness of sins and a place among those who are sanctified by faith in me. So that's, that's a statement that God desires us to go from darkness into light, from the power of Satan to uh, God. So we receive forgiveness. If I don't walk into the light, I'm not receiving the fullness of his forgiveness. That's where I find his forgiveness is, is in his truth, right? God is patient. The word says that he's patient in Second Peter uh, 3, 9. The Lord is not slow in keeping his promise, as some understand slowness. Instead, he's patient with you, not wanting anyone to perish, but everyone to come to uh, repentance. You know, there's times we give up on some people. Like I said, some people's heart can just be hard. It can take time to soften them. Some, no matter how much we love them, they're just going to be hard. But we don't always know what's buried underneath there. So sometimes we give up too soon. Uh, soon enough. <laughs> you know, but either way, God is patient. God knows exactly the timing uh, that we need. Um, he's patient to bear with us. It doesn't mean that he tolerates every, absolutely everything from us. It doesn't mean that he just lets us go and go and go and says it's okay. But it means that he's patient in the sense, like I think about it when I was in a place of rebellion, he was always there waiting for me to return. He wasn't chasing after me. He wasn't begging me, come home, obey, be godly. He wasn't begging me, listen to me, hear me. You know, he wasn't chasing me down and hunting me down. But he was always there ready to receive me back. Uh, he was patient with me. He recognized I was in a, a bad state. I was, I was lost. I was struggling to be found. Uh, and I didn't know, I, I've said this before on, on a, another show, it was like I was on a train and, and the train was moving full speed ahead and just kept going faster and faster and I couldn't figure out how to get off. And it's times like that where you just jump, you know, <laughs> you just jump. You just do something to shock yourself out of that place and just get off it. But I, I was so traumatized and so broken and so hurting I couldn't. And sometimes we're in that place. We're in that place where we're buried under so many lies, so much darkness, so much pain, so much hurt, so much anger, so much fear, uh, whatever it is, that we just can't see who he is or receive the fullness of who he is yet. And he's patient with us. He bears with us because he desires that we all come to that place of repentance and that we receive the fullness of who he is and all that he's offered us. The word says he, God is also our creator which of course, I mean, look around. We talked about this a little over the last couple of weeks. Just looking around and seeing all of creation, we can uh, recognize. And in fact, the word says that we have no excuse, that, that the, the creation around us, his handiwork in creation is enough to reveal to us that God exists and that God is good and that he's real. Um, but Genesis 1.1, we know, says, in the beginning... God created the heavens and the earth, and it goes on and it tells us about all he created. In Nehemiah 9, 6, it says, You alone are the Lord. You have made the heavens, the heaven of the heavens with all their host, the earth and all that is on it, the seas and all that is in them. You give life. So he's the life giver. You give life to all of them, and the heavenly hosts bow down before you. Isaiah 66, 2 says, For my hand made all these things. And yeah, I mean, just think about that. How, how big are the hands of God? I think about that sometimes. Like, I realize he's not a man or a woman as, as far as a fleshly person, so he can't measure the, his, his size by that. But think about that. It says that he holds the whole universe in his hand, not his hands picture it like this, or what that song that we sing, he's got the whole world in his hands. It says he holds the whole universe in his hand, not hands. So, like, okay, that's big, but, like, the entire universe? That's, like, how do you even fathom how huge and how great he is? And then it says he made all these things with those hands. And it says, thus all these things came into being, declares the Lord. But to this one... I will look to him who is humble and contrite of spirit and who trembles at my word. And that, of course, means, uh, means not fear as in tremble, like I'm terrified of him, but who honors, who respects, and who values 
uh, my word. So he's made all these things. He's this grand and great creator. And, you know, I think often, sometimes I don't feel like I'm so creative. I, I know I'm creative in some things, but, you know, like you see certain artists, certain musicians, and, and different people, and you realize these people are like phenomenally creative. Like, that's some serious creativity there. That, that gift comes from the creativity in, in God. We are made in His image, and, and it's His creativity that then passes on to us as mankind that allows us to be creative. And so then when I remember, wait a minute, I may not feel like I'm so creative, I may not think I'm as creative as this one or that one, but I'm not meant to compare myself to somebody else, and neither are you. But each of us have uh, that creative power of God living in us. If we know Him, His creativity is in us. So all we have to do is say, Lord, you're creative. And any area where I'm not uh, feeling creative or where I'm struggling to be creative, I know that you're creative and that through you I can do all things. And so I just receive your creativity in this situation and I know that you'll help me to be creative. And He will. He'll help you be, to be creative. Uh, Jeremiah 10, 11. Thus you shall say to them, the gods that did not make the heavens and the earth will perish from the earth and from under the heavens. I thought that that was interesting. The gods that did not make the heavens and the earth. So there's a God who made the heavens and the earth, and that's the God that we're talking about, this creator God. But then there are gods that didn't make the heavens and the earth, and it says that they'll perish from the earth and from under the heavens, just like we do. Just like people come and go, the gods of this earth, the gods that we've created, the gods that are not the beginning and the end, the Alpha and the Omega, the gods that are not um, the same yesterday, today, and forever, the gods that have no light, that have no power, that have no true authority except that which we've given them, those will perish from this earth. But our God remains. He remains forever. <clears throat> God is love. You know, this is one we, we hear about quite a bit, but we don't always uh, act on very well. Um, but God is love. John 3.16, it's a popular scripture verse. If you're a believer, you've for sure heard it. But for God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son, that whoever believes in him shall not perish but have eternal life. We know that God loves us and that he loved us so much. He sent Jesus to live, to live sinlessly, and to die and then to resurrect for us so that we might be forgiven, be restored to right relationship with God, and then have power to, to walk in victory over sin and wickedness and darkness so that we could um, enjoy eternal life with Him. First John, in fact, that's evidence that God is good right there if you were looking for evidence that God is good. Uh, First John uh, 4.16 says, So we have come to know and to believe the love that God has for us. God is love, and whoever abides in his love abides in God, and God abides in him. And then John 4, 8, as you go up um, back in that scripture, anyone who does not love does not know God because God is love. So if you're struggling to love right now, there's an aspect of God you haven't discovered yet, not probably an aspect of his love that you haven't discovered. Because the more you understand his love, the more you will love. The more you receive love, the more love will pour out of you. The more you give love, the more you receive love. It's a, it's a reciprocal thing. As you embrace the love of God, you can allow the love of God to flow through you. As you let the love of God flow through you, you're able to receive more and more of His love for you. It's, it's a reciprocal thing. Romans 5, 8 says, But God shows His love for us in that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. I always find this scripture powerful. When I think about people in my life who've hurt me, done things to me, whether intentionally or unintentionally, or just even people who haven't been there for you or something like that, just think about anybody who's, who has done you wrong in any kind of a way. Would you be willing to die for that person right now? If, if, if they were burning in a fire, if someone was about to shoot them, if some harm was coming their way, how quick would you be to jump in the face of that harm to stop it? 
you know, a lot of us would have to pause and think about it for a minute. A lot of us would weigh out, well, how bad was it what they really did? You know, a lot of us, uh, in fact, I'd say probably all of us, unless we've really truly thought this through and worked this out already in our life, we, we'd have to be like, well, I could forgive this one. I, I'd, I'd help this one, but not this one. Or what this one did, okay, yeah, but what this one did, no. Like, we'd be somehow weighing what it was they did. But when you think about what Jesus did, Jesus past sin and sinners, for all present sin and sinners, and for all future sin and sinners, and that includes me and you, you know, and, and God gave him up to do that for us, you know, I mean, that's some serious, powerful love, would you do that for your worst enemy, we were his worst enemies, and yet he, and he even knew all the horrible things that we would do in our lives, and yet he still chose to go to the cross for us. God still chose to give his son Jesus to, to die for us. And that's pretty powerful. So to have that kind of love for one another. In fact, as believers, I've talked about this before, that's an area that we're, we, we tend to be a little bit weak in, is, is that area of loving one another, where, where the Bible talks about how uh, the world will know us by our love, and not by our love for the world, but our love for one another. And that seems to be the area we struggle the most um, in the church, is to love one another well and then love people. It, it's easy to love people outside your house and, <laughs> and then go back to your house and be all kinds of ugly, you know, <laughs> because those people are supposed to stick with you, right? And the same thing happens in church. But to be truly transformed, we have to be transformed with the people we live with on the daily, the people that we're with 24-7, the people we're with every week at church, the people we congregate with, the people we're closest to. Those are the people who will see our true colors but need to see that real true transformation in us where we're walking out our salvation and becoming truly made new in our actions, our character, our behavior, where, where that stuff gets worked out in us. And, and that happens the more we get to the place where no matter what you did to us or to me, it, it doesn't compare to what I've done to Christ. And if Christ could give up his life for me, then I can still love you. I can still forgive you. I can still want God's best for you. I can still want you to be saved. I can still want you to be blessed. And when you can start pray, praying for your enemies, in that way, then you know you're starting to step into that depth of God's love that he has for us. First John 4, 7, Beloved, let us love one another, for love is of God or from God, and whoever loves has been born of God and knows God. Psalm uh, 86, 15 says, But you, O Lord, are God, merciful and gracious. So here we also see he's merciful and he's gracious. He's slow to anger. God is slow to anger and abundant, abounding in steadfast love and faithfulness. Then we also know, uh, lastly, that God is spirit. Uh, and as I said before, there's so many things that we could cover on his characteristics, who he is, his names, and all of that. So literally, we're just scratching the surface. But God is also spirit, which means like he's, he's breath. And he's alive, but he's not contained. And like we're contained in a body, we're contained in a physical form, like this. But he's not contained um, by um, a fleshly body. John 4:24 says, "God is spirit, and his worshippers must worship in the spirit and in truth." And Numbers 23:19 says, "God is not human, that he." should lie. I mentioned that a little bit earlier. God is not human that he should lie. He's not a human being that he should change his mind. Does he speak and then not act? Does he promise and not fulfill? And like I talked about earlier, that's human nature. We can speak and not act. I can say I'm going to do something and I break my word and I don't do it. Or I forget and I don't do it. Or I can promise I'm going to do something and it, it just never happens. I don't fulfill it or I go back on my word. Human beings do that. God doesn't do that. If God promised it, it's yea and amen. If God spoke it, he will act on it. He's a living God. Uh, Psalm 84, uh, 12. I think, no, uh, 84, 2. I think it is. One desperately, or I desperately want to be in the courts of the Lord's temple. My heart and my entire being shout 
for joy to the living God. He is alive. Uh, God doesn't die. Nothing can kill him. You can hate him all you want, and he still lives. You can ignore him all you want, and he'll still exist. <laughs> you can deny his power, but his power still remains. You can deny his love and refuse his love, yet his love is still there. He's a living God. He exists. He, he is present. The word tells us that he's all present. Um, he, he is always there. And he's alive. He's not dead. You can't kill him. <laughs> you can deny him. But you can't take away the fact that he's alive. Uh, Colossians 1.15 says he uh, is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn over all creation. That's talking about Jesus. That, that Jesus was the image of the invisible God. This like it talks about how uh, we're made in the image of God. But he was the firstborn over all creation. First Timothy 1.17 Now to the eternal king, immortal, invisible, the only God, the honor and glory forever and ever. Here we see some other uh, characteristics or names or um, terms that refer to God. He's the eternal king. There's no king that's eternal. Whatever nation you look at right now that has a king, that king only lasts for a, a period of time. That king does not last uh, more than their individual lifetime. But God, our God, is eternal king. His, his rule and his reign never ends. There wasn't a beginning and there's no end. He's just been. Um, he's immortal, uh, immortal. Like I said, you can't kill him. He's there. He's alive and he doesn't die. There isn't death in him, so he can't die. <laughs> As we talked about earlier where it said he's faithful just because that's who he is. What was the scripture? It, he can't deny who he is, yeah. Because he's faithful. He's also alive. He can't be death because he's not death. Um, it's, he's invisible. We can't see him. We can see who he is around us. We can see his works. We can see his handiwork. Um, we can see what he's done. And he reveals himself to us in different ways. But he's not necessarily visible like you and I are visible to one another. It says he's the only God. So you can come up with false gods. You and I can create idols and things to worship and things that we believe have some sort of power, but we know he is the only God. Um, there is none beside him. And then, of course, glory and honor are his. John 1.18, No one has ever seen God, the only one himself, God, who is in closest fellowship with the Father, has made God known. So Jesus has known God, has seen him, but none of us have seen In fact, Moses, uh, uh, when, when he was um, receiving, there was a, a time where that, it talks about how he went to receive the, the commandments and he wanted to see God's glory. And um, he wasn't able to, to see like the fullness of God's glory. He was able to see it pass. He, he, he didn't see his face. He, he saw him in passing. So there's, there's ways where we can like just touch a little bit of who God is. There's ways we can, you know, can experience and contain just part of him. But he's so great. He's so grand. He's so vast. He's so amazing. We can't contain all of who he is. It would kill us. It would kill us to try and take in all of who he is. And so in his mercy, he kind of, uh, keeps some parts of himself to us and we get little bits here and there and in some kind of a way. So when his, his glory passed by, he saw the back of it, not the whole, um, not his whole presence. And uh, it's my prayer for each of us that as we get to know God more fully, more deeply, that we just embrace and immerse ourselves in, in each aspect of God as he reveals himself to us. As I said, he doesn't reveal the fullness of who he is to us all at once. It would be too overwhelming. He gives us time to get to know him, just like we get to know each other. You know, he takes time, just just like you need to get to know uh, some of the people in your life. He, he is patient. He takes time with us to get to know him. He reveals himself to us as Father God. He reveals himself to us as Provider. He reveals himself to us as our healer. Uh, the Psalms talks about him being our refuge, about him being our fortress, our strong tower, our mighty God, the one who saves us. He's our salvation. Uh, he's our victory. He's truth. Uh, there's, there's so many 
words, uh, terms, and characteristics that are in him, we literally can't exhaust it all. But whatever it is you need today, whoever, whichever aspect of God you need to know today or to get to know deeper, I just pray that you just dig deeper into him, that you open your heart, your mind, your eyes, your ears. I, I, I pray that whatever has been blocking that, that place um, between you and him where, where you desire to get to know him more, where you desire to, to embrace him more, where you desire to walk more in the fruits of who he is in and through you, where you just desire to honor him and glorify him and worship him, but for some reason those fleshly things get in the way. I just, I just pray for all of us that, um, we would just, throughout this year, throughout this time, this season of our life, we would just continually surrender and, and open ourselves up to Him to let Him be who He is. You know, even to, even to, to shed off all of these preconceived ideas of us. I've heard people say, like, you can't put God in a box, and yet, in our human nature, our, our, human understanding that's where he always is he's in some kind of a box whether it's a big one a small one or whatever shaped one <laughs> we, we have him locked up somewhere and and in our minds he ends somewhere you know his goodness ends here his faithfulness ends here his provision ends here it, it can only fill up this much or it can only be this big and yet it's never ending his mercies are new if you think that that God's finished with you and that there's no tomorrow for you, there's no hope, whatever you did, it's, it's finished. His mercies are new every morning. As long as you've got breath in your lungs, as long as your heart is still beating, as long as you have thoughts in your brain, God can still move in and through you. He can still change and transform your life. He can still, uh, turn your, your sorrows into dancing. He can still turn your trash into treasure. He can still transform your life if you're willing to let him, if you're willing to receive him. And that goes the same for the people who we're believing for. Sometimes there's people that we love and that we desire would know God and they haven't come to know him yet. I believe their day is coming and I stand with you in faith that that you and I and those that, that we love and that we care about will know him. The word says every need. Jesus Christ is Lord, right? So there will come a day where we all believe that. But I pray it be when we're all willing. <laughs> when when we're all seeking and searching and 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 receiving him and walking in the fullness of who he is and who he called us to be. So this week, this month, this year, you know, go outside, look at the trees, look at the birds, look at your uh, family, your friends, look into somebody's eyes and just think about how those eyes were made. Look at somebody's hands and think about how those hands were made. Think about who made those hands and what they reveal. And, uh, you know, look at your computer. My husband was talking this morning about just the, the little, um, chips, like, or the SIM cards in a phone and how they store so much information. And in the past, we used to have big, huge filing cabinets with all kinds of information because in our, you know, finite minds, that's how we figured out how to file and keep things. But yet, because uh, we have that ability to be creative, we've now found a way to take these tiny little chips and store information in them. I mean, just that alone is, is phenomenal. That didn't come for out of just nowhere. That just didn't, boom, nothing became something. That's the handiwork of God that gave us the ability to create. And, and to be creative and, and to do really incredible and amazing things. So look around you. Look around you and ask God to reveal who he is uh, in you and through you and just simply around you. Have a blessed week and enjoy the presence of God. God bless you.